Um, thanks very much. I think the, the energy in the room has been the best that we've had in the whole country, which is very disappointing to me as a Melbourneian. <laughs> I sincerely hope the cup does not come over the continent or <coughs> stay over this side. Um, being an Essendon supporter, you'll all sympathise with me, I'm sure. Um, I'll, I'll introduce the film, but I, I think it's... I was just reflecting on... I'm talking about empathy, which is one of the things people say I lack the most of because I tend to not suffer fools gladly. Um, the, and it's interesting to be in a position as an advocate because I don't see myself as an advocate really more as being straightforward about well, if I see something, I just call it out. People say that's not very good for your career, but I don't know a better way to do it. The And I'll just... so. This week at the Human Rights um, yeah, Committee looking into restrictive practices, I opened up by saying that the law was stupid and stupid in three ways. Um, probably not the best way to be empathetic to legislators who are curious, but I didn't want anyone to confuse what I thought. And the hour before me, the legally trained and very competent public advocates from all across Australia had been calmly saying how the law wasn't going to work and wasn't in the interests of anyone. But I didn't see the committee really sort of um, connecting, but maybe they weren't showing any emotion. So I'd opened up with that, which isn't very empathetic, but really I think is calling a spade a spade in terms of restrictive practice. In terms of clinical practice, and one of the reasons the film came about was um, the teams that I work with were overprotective of patients. So doctor, hospital, patients, that's all right. So I'm allowed to use the word patients. The idea of consumer and facility to me is just still rubbish because you can't name things if you don't have the power that goes with them and giving it a name does not give you the power. And I think we just dress that up to say someone is a consumer when they have no ability to exercise their rights as a consumer would. So if I am a resident in a facility and I am a true consumer, then I could leave today the same way that I would leave the hotel and I could complain without repercussions and people would fuss over me to deliver what I wanted rather than have me have my lunch at 12 on the dot and so forth. So... Those issues are difficult to engage staff in a way that makes them want to change. And one of the things that I had not learnt was that I was convincing, perhaps, but people didn't challenge me because I am older. I'm older than Anthony, obviously. <laughs> Always wear a charcoal suit with a tie and a white shirt where I can. And so what I confused was positional authority and people listening to me but not following my instructions with me having a persuasive argument. And my argument is very persuasive. It's just irritating to people because it makes them feel uncomfortable. <laughs> and so the examples with the staff were... And, and I, you know, I, I often hear that our 90-year-old patient cannot go home because the house is not safe. It might burn down. They can't get out if it burns down. Um, the hot water's not working, they can't shower twice a day when they're used to having a bath once a week. <laughs> so I, I would just say, no, they've got to go home. And then eventually, as I got older, I tried to infuse a bit of humour because as the generation gap grows between me and the rest of the allied health team, because most nurses in allied health will work from 25 to 35 then usually um, family duties call and they come back in their 50s or 60s. The 50s and 60 year olds are no trouble. They're actually supportive because they've had life experience and they know that there's more to health, there's more to life than health. But my favorite two stories were the one where the staff came and said they found a live rat in a person's house and they clearly could not go home. It would be <laughs> breaching our duty of care to do that. And I, I mean, it was late afternoon, I don't know whether I was intolerant. I said, well, that's really terrific. The house is warm, there's food. <laughs> Why would a rat be there otherwise? <laughs> Let's send them home next week. 
that happened because they had nowhere to go. Like, how would you argue that point with me? So whether it's humorous, irrational, or whatever you want to think about it, it made them start to think slightly differently. Six months later, they come back, and they gang up on me this time. They found a dead mouse <laughs> on the porch. And they, they remembered, because they obviously hadn't forgotten the, the comment from six months ago. I said, oh, well, there's a dead mouse. So clearly the house is not warm, and there's no food. I said, but there's no vermin now because it's all dead, so they're safe to go home again. And this is just a, a recurring theme really over the last 10 to 15 years. And as I get older, and the more people I talk to that are older, the things that they value are very different to what we hold dear um, growing up. And we tend to put barriers in front of people doing what they want to do. And so this film came about because... I learnt that I wasn't persuasive. People were just scared that they were going to be examined on the material. Um, or they followed through with the instructions but were never convinced. And it was no point having a, a decision executed if I hadn't convinced the team that their attitude needed to be reshaped. And so I was fortunate to work with Pratik Bando who um, gave up a career as an eye specialist um, unheard of, I know, I still can't believe it, um, to go work with George Miller in Sydney as a scriptwriter for five years. Um, Pratik was a student of mine back in the 90s um, when I was teaching public health, um, and so he remembered me, got me onto Facebook, because that was the only way he would communicate in the late 2000s. I had never heard of it, get this message, log into Facebook to get an email, I thought, why couldn't you just write the email? using my address. <laughs> he had a younger friend that's even um, more interesting in Jeremy Lee, who's a professional illustrator and makes his career, obviously, with that and is currently illustrating Arne Doe's um, books, doing Wolf Girl. I don't know people with kids would... Everyone seems to know Wolf Girl. Um, so they're really very creative in how they think things through. I gave them a essentially a lecture with the same tone that I would have spoken to my staff about, of course they're safe to go home, they're going home, I really don't care what you say. And they were able to change that into a story that has been uh, screened internationally at eight film festivals now, so each festival you get a laurel, um, so it is a big deal. We got into the United Nations social justice film and I get to give my opinion at Stanford University and because everyone's terribly polite they've got to stay much like you do <laughs> and so I think I'm doing a fabulous job because no one is leaving um, and so that film was selected out of um, 600 entrants um, it was one of 40 films um, for that it sat with social justice topic and we thought we were a good show to win an award because we'd won best film in Washington DC three months earlier um, I don't know what the circuit is in terms of um, films, but it's not quite like winning the Golden Globes and the Academy Awards. So Washington, D.C. social justice did not translate to the United Nations. And I'm going to lose time, I know. Yes. Um, so the film that won was uh, on acid attacks on young women in India. So in terms of where the film finds an audience, it finds an audience on social justice topics rights of individuals. Um, we did not get into the film festival at our university hospital, and I still, to this day, cannot get an explanation why our own university hospital would not accept us. Um, and we got best animation in Seattle, so we've had far better success in the States than Australia. The film's animated, um, so it should catch you off guard. The way to watch it is quietly in a darkened room. Uh, it goes for 15 minutes, and I'll come back and talk more technical stuff um, after the film. So, if we can. Thanks for that. Um, the, the film does get um, some people very teary-eyed. Um, we had, uh, the first time we showed it in the States, um, we had quite a few people in tears um, 
and that was relieved to a degree by someone who said, was it a real story? Did I take him to the cricket? Um, and I was able to say, no, it wasn't a true story, but a composite. I think what the film shows to me, and my career um, is very traditional medical science. So um, older than Anthony was at primary school and high school before him, went straight to university and studied for, I, I count, 35 years, I think, from when I was four. <laughs> yeah. They were the good days when you could go to school early. You didn't have to wait to six. You go at four and you get stuff done. <laughs> and I finished my PhD in my late 30s. And I did my PhD on quality of care and measurement. Um, and it was around the patient safety movement came after that fairly quickly. And I was convinced that if you're able to measure and provide evidence, people would change. People would listen to facts. People would be convinced by numbers. And people would be convinced by strong logical argument. It's almost 30 years later, I find that does not persuade people. People do not get up to the facts until they are engaged in the issue. And what we've found is that of all the work that we've done, the dignity of risk issue around choice, autonomy, self-determination has had far more persuasive power than the work that we've done on suicide, resident to resident assault, um, poor clinical care, um, wound harm from wound injuries. All of those things remain academic and people don't associate with them. And so it's very difficult to engage. On this topic, the film has been far better and this 15 minute animation, this 15 minute cartoon, has done more in terms of advancing an issue than 30 years of publication. And I have 150 academic peer review articles and the way the university works is they can tell you how many people have read each one and how many times each one has been cited. They don't match the persuasive power of storytelling and engagement and getting culture change with staff, um, families and the, the people that support you with your work. So to me, I, you know, the, the film was better than data. The film talks about what's important to the individual. The definition of dignity of risk is important to, to contemplate and it's taken me several years to, to eventually come to some form of understanding. And it's one word, dignity of risk. It's not separated. You've got to keep those, those together. And it came from the intellectual disability sector in the 1970s. And advocacy then by, by families and parents were for their children with a disability to be allowed to engage in society. And the way we engage is we make our own decisions. They didn't want their kids to... Well, they obviously didn't want them to make bad decisions, but they wanted them to make decisions. The minute you allow people to make decisions, you can't tell them whether it's a good... You, sorry. You can tell them whether it's a good or bad decision, but you have to respect their decision. And it's in making the decision is where the dignity is. The risk comes with a bad decision being made, but some bad decisions, you might have luck on your side and you still have a good outcome. So many of us would have made bad decisions which we were lucky and escaped any trouble. Other times we've made fabulous decisions and any time any of us got married, we think we've made a fabulous decision <laughs> at that time. And about 50% of us, sometime down the track, realised the decision wasn't so good in retrospect. <laughs> but it's about making the decision. It's not whether the decision is good or bad. It's not whether the outcome from the decision is good or bad. It's the dignity of risk is I get to make my decision, and by making my decision, that's who I am. And if it's a bad decision, then I learn to live with it. If it's a good decision, I learn to make better decisions or reward myself for it. And the learning, the learning and the being is in making the mistakes and choosing your own path, not one chosen for you. So all of us would have been informed on, but yeah, by our parents who we should hang out with at school and who we should or shouldn't go out with and who we should or shouldn't marry. Almost all of us wouldn't have taken that advice. 
um, to some regrets, I'm sure, in some places. But we own the decision, and by owning your decision, you are defining yourself. And so the dignity of risk is a way of explaining to people that if I'm going to respect your autonomy, respect your self-determination, I have to respect your decision. Again, it's not whether it's good or bad. And so in medicine, we're looking to make good decisions all the time. And so when a bad decision is being made, we think that contradicts or our responsibility is duty of care. But the hard thing, and one, one of the reasons that we had myself as an old male doctor going from the duty of care as paramount through to a person's life is what's important and as a doctor I'm invited into their life I'm not you've got to remember I'm invited into people's lives we often don't see that and many of the issues that involve your life do not involve a doctor and so having a doctor decide how you live your life is not a good way to be unless you have a health-related issue. And this is where we've gotten very confused with aged care is that we think it's about health all the time and it's not. And going to your doctor about how to live your life, you know, the example would be, um, it is, is bad to do that because as a doctor, you ask for my advice, I will give it, and give it with conviction. <laughs> I, I have no hesitation, and I have an opinion on everything, and I'm confident it's the right one. <laughs> so it's very difficult to win an argument. Even with a lawyer, I'll still hold my ground. The, but the, the fundamental is that you do not go... I, I don't know, how many people have been to their GP in the last 12 months? And I'm going to assume well, it's at least half. <laughs> Did you go to your GP and say, I have six weeks of annual leave coming up. I don't know if you're allowed in this firm that much leave. <laughs> Where do you suggest I take my annual leave to enjoy myself? Did anyone ask their GP that? <laughs> if you didn't ask your GP where you should spend your holidays, why, when you're 90 in residential care, would you suddenly be asking a doctor for permission to do things that are important to your life. You might want medical advice about the safer way to eat something, but you do not want their advice about whether to or not to. You want to know what is the safer way to do it. What is a better way to walk a long distance? What should I do that reduces my risk of falling, not stay seated? So that's really important to remember is that we're not getting you're not getting life advice from a doctor, you're getting health, medical, disease-related advice. And we need to separate those out really clearly from autonomy and decision-making for yourself versus duty of care and health. The other issue that we have with dignity of risk is the... Again, comes to the storytelling, is that people will be frightened of doing things because of their perception of risk. And we are more worried about terrorists than we are about being run over by a car. And we're more likely to die from a road crash than a terrorist attack. But we don't worry as much about a car crash because it's familiar. We see it all, not, not the death. We see cars every day with no one getting hurt. We know how to drive and we're good drivers. Are you waving or are you giving me five minutes? We're, we're, we're familiar with the activity. We have control of it because we drive it and we're good enough. And again, you know the stats, two thirds of us think we're better than the average driver. So I know if I'm driving, I will be able to compensate for the idiot on the road and we will both be safe. Whereas a terrorist, I can't identify, I don't know, comes out of the blue. I get horrific scenes and I'm frightened and it's out of my control. And so in terms of risk perception, and there's a lot of research on risk perception, is we're very fearful of things that are strange, out of our control that we don't understand. Um, and in business, I can't remember, one of Parkinson's laws, I'm just sidetracking because I prompted me was 
you know, there's a law around management is people will spend far more time debating the small purchases than they will on multi-million dollars. And we will argue about what sort of coffee machine we will make or buy because we all know what they're like and we will fuss about 10 or $20 around it. But for something that's $100 million, we're all a bit, what's $100 million look like and that sails <laughs> through. But the argument about what we stock the office with, that generates the most. And it's the same thing about we argue the things that we're familiar with, we focus on and are comfortable with. And so if we don't understand that's what the majority of our staff are going to do, we can't get the culture change. So a personal care worker is not going to say, dignity of risk, let me at it, I can see all of the residents I'm looking after are going to be choking while I'm feeding them. <laughs> They're going to just walk out into wet areas whenever they feel like it and fall. That, that's not what people want. And their fear is, how are you as senior management and board going to treat them? How is the nursing board going to treat them if they're nurses? But personal care attendants don't have to worry about that because they've got no rules around them. Which is another problem, yes. <laughs> but what will the regulator do? And if the regulator comes down hard on something that they've done that puts sanctions on the facility, are they going to keep their job? So they're not sitting here thinking, I'm going to respect the rights of an individual that they are providing care for. They are frightened of getting into trouble and losing their job. And so it's that perception that's got to be dealt with um, really upfront and very clearly. And the only way to do that is by demonstrating respect for the actions that you want to take, not by talking about them. And the issue here comes back to what we think, what we say, and what we do. And I always use the, the example of my presentations um, and my PhD students. When they start, they're very respectful, and they sit and listen, and they never leave till I finish. Towards the end, they just walk out thinking, he's on a run, and Diana would do the same. <laughs> he's not going to stop. Got an audience, we'll keep talking. And I do that because when I'm talking, I get new ideas because I'm thinking out aloud and watching the response. So for me, talking is really just testing ideas. Not good for anyone else, but works well for me. <laughs> but that gives me the sense of the students at the very start were thinking, I wish you would finish so I could leave, but they didn't. And at the end, when they know me well, they just leave because they know there are no consequences, mostly. <laughs> But what you think, what you say, what you do is very, very different. And in the area of dignity of risk, in the area where people will get hurt, there's no... I'm not saying let's do it and all will be well with the world. People will get hurt, people will die. There's no, no doubt in my mind that will happen. But people die climbing Everest trying to achieve a lifelong dream. And if you're 90, you should still have a choice about how you want to live your life. How we deal with the harm that occurs when we've respected someone's choices, <laughs> how we deal with the death that's occurred, with the staff involved, and what we do as an organisation determines whether this initiative succeeds or not. It's easy to say we respect choice and we will do that. It doesn't work that way. We have to be prepared for the really ugly side of it, and the ugly side is people will choke to death. People will go out for a walk and fall and break their hip. People will go out for a walk to a cafe, get lost and not come back. The numbers are vanishingly small that come to harm, but that's what sticks in people's mind. And I come back to the example of the fire, and I don't know how many people know whether a old-aged pensioner at 90 who's gone home and who didn't have steps and a rail put in burnt to death in their house because of it but that is front and centre of how our occupational therapists are trained and they will still come to me and last month one of the new occupational therapists came to me and said the rails aren't there, they can't manage steps if the house was to catch fire they couldn't get out 
what do you think I said? Well, I didn't say that quite that time. Because <laughs> I was getting, 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 I thought, I got, I said, I'm sure they'll be able to crawl out. <laughs> because if there's a fire burning, you'll do anything to get out. And you didn't tell me they couldn't crawl. And do you know the smoke rises and so you want to be down on the ground <laughs> when you get out. So in fact, not having those steps with rails is actually ideal. <laughs> that person went home again. There's no counter-argument. But I don't know if I persuaded them or not. But it's... We're dealing with perception, and perception is really, really hard to shape. And it shapes our thinking, and it's shaped my thinking for a long time until people challenge it about what I'm advocating for. And it is really hard to shape your training, and you don't know that you have it in you. And so you know, the, the desire to be responsible and do, make a good decision every time and protect people from themselves is something I've got to fight almost every day because that's my training and to be a good doctor, that's what I should do. To respect a person's human rights, and this is where I, I, I've grown fond of lawyers, which is unusual <laughs> for a doctor, is lawyers give us a very different way of thinking and a clarity around the rights of an individual. And your health is only one part of those rights. It's not the only thing. And in health and that environment, which doesn't mix, the reinforcing is always health is the most important thing. One minute. And so we don't, we, we struggle then to do the things that are needed when you're going to doctors and nurses for that. We don't want doctors and nurses to disregard the sense of duty and care and responsibility because most of their job's on that but we do need to be mindful not to go to us when we've got issues that are to do with your lifestyle or your choice as an individual. The final thing I wanted to say was really around the law being an enabler here. It's not... So there are some um, yeah, artistic um, licence taken, the teddy bear being one, just... <laughs> so no-one here, I assume, believes I sleep with a teddy bear. Oh, I'm not convinced that... So the sense of a waiver really is there for dramatic effect. A waiver will not work. A waiver does not support a person. The, the legislation and our obligation to each other is to help each other achieve our collective goals, which is respect and optimising what we're able to do. Saying, I signed this and it's on your head does not work. And the example, again, I use is that if you have a patient with... Let's go with Mr Jones. He wants to eat something at risk of choking. You provide it to him. Do you stay with him or do you leave the room? How many people stay? How many people leave? Of the people that leave, when do you come back? <laughs> when do you come... Do you come back in two minutes or do you come back in half an hour? You stay or you come back in half an hour because in half an hour he's either dead, <laughs> I'm right, you shouldn't have had it because you're going to choke, or he's right and he's still alive. But that's not supporting some of that all or nothing phenomenon that we see is not supporting the outright banning of smoking, of drinking alcohol, which are very bad for you, all of those things. So do not smoke. Medical advice, do not smoke. Lifestyle advice, I prefer you not to smoke and would argue for you not to smoke, but ultimately if you want to, then you, then you should do it out of my sight. <laughs> but, but in terms of health, the level of alcohol you need to take in is moderate. And so the question is, are you coming to your doctor or nurse for health advice or life advice? And if it's life advice, then it's what you say that goes and you bear the risks and consequences, which is why it's your decision, which is where we end up with. 
we all expect our dignity of risk to be respected today. Just because I cross the threshold into an aged care home doesn't mean my rights go with me. And that's what's currently happening is my rights go with me. And so at that point, I have to stop. They Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.